Okay, ownership of real property. Okay, that's what this is all about. You're selling, you want people to own. And when we own real property, we're going to talk about different ways that we're going to actually kind of own it jointly, separately, things like that tonight. Um, it gets a little confusing where we talk about tenancy by the t entirety, how people survive, what gets passed on. Um, and so I'm going to try to give you some tips for trying to clarify what you need to remember for a test so it doesn't become confusing with all the different types of ownership. So we're going to talk about individual ownership, that's just you owning it by yourself. We'll talk about requirements for tenancy in common when more than one person owns it. Joint tenancy, tenancy by the entirety, that's the one that we're talking about for marriage. Explain the requirements for community property. And Ohio is not a community property state. Ohio is, is a, the marriage dower state. Um, we used to recognize common law marriage, but in the early 90s, Ohio put recognizing common law marriage as well. Um, and then we're also going to talk about the differences in holding title and business entities. The holding title and business entities, if you had basic business real estate, um, business real estate, business law, these ownership entities, business entities are going to all be a, a repeat of what you know. But there's reasons in real estate why we take ownership in certain business entities, what we're going to do. Okay, so co-tenancy, concurrent ownership means that two or more people own the same property at the same time. It's also given to them at the same time, typically. Um, it recognizes four main forms of concurrent ownership. Tenancy in common, joint tenancy, tenancy by the entirety, and community property. Like I said, Ohio does not recognize community property. A lot of states do. And we'll talk about some of that differences. Okay, so tenancy in common. Parties can hold equal or unequal shares in the land. They have a separate but undivided interest in the entire property as a whole. So they have a creation of the interest. They're given the property or they buy it together. There's possession. They actually are using it, inhabiting it, whatever. And then there's the conveyance of the interest, how they're taking the deed title to it. We have large buildings that are also owned as tenants in common. We call them TICs, T-I-C, tenant in common. Um, the building that comes to mind is the corner at the corner of I-275 and 71. It's a big white office building. It's owned by tenants in common. And the easiest way to remember this is there are 30 property owners. At any time, they can sell their separate interests. But in order to run that property, they all have to agree on how it's going to be run. So in a small, like a home ownership, where tenants in common are owning it together, they, everybody has the right to have occupancy. You can share it, you can dictate how you're going to do that, but everybody has the right to have occupancy. But they have to agree overall on how they're going to operate the property. And if they don't agree, that tenancy in common may not last for a long time. Um, another where tenancy in common might happen is where we have brothers and sisters, relatives, that are not necessarily a married spouse. So it can be married, it can be friends, tenants in common can be a lot of things. A joint tenancy is where two more persons own equal shares the property with a right of survivorship. So the difference between tenants in common and joint tenancy is something called a right of survivorship. That's really the primary difference. Right of survivorship, one person dies, everything goes to the other person. Or if we have three parties that own it together, one person dies, then the other two owners, instead of owning one-third interest, they own 50% interest because it's survivorship. The characteristics, the four unities have to be present for joint tenancy. Again, conveyance, simultaneous death of joint tenants. There's a mortgage and a lease by a joint tenants to sever this joint tenancy. So they can sell, they have simultaneous death, they can have a mortgage where they take out a mortgage and create a different interest in the property, or they can do a lease. 
So they, the joint tenancy can be severed. Again, it's different than tenants in common because it has survivorship. So remember that. Survivorship goes along with joint tenancy. Marital property. This is tenancy by the entirety. So the way to remember this is when I get married, I'm marrying forever to the entirety. Entirety for the whole. That's part of your marriage vow. You're going to marry forever. Um, so tenancy by the entirety is married couples. We can have community property or tenancy by the entirety or dower curtsy rights. In Ohio, we recognize the dower curtsy rights. We don't recognize the community property laws. Famous couples, when they get divorced, sometimes they'll, they'll own houses in many states and they'll try to get the divorce proceedings to go to a community property state or something else. They'll ask for it to be heard somewhere where they think they can get the best right to get ownership or half the estate or something like that. In Ohio, it's tenancy by the entirety. Dower curtsy rights come in. Any marriage property that's owned separately, brought into the property, into the marriage together, it still can be separate by whoever brings it into the marriage. It's separate by inheritance, by the earnings, by different things that are done. It's the divorce decree that decides how the property actually gets split. But tenancy by the entirety, if a spouse dies, there's not a will, one third of the estate through our dower rights is automatically going to go to the surviving spouse. Okay? And dower and curtsy are the same thing. Curtsy is the widower, dower is the widow. But we don't really call it curtsy rights, we just call it dower rights. This is why whenever we have a sale of property that's owned by married couples, both couples have to sign all the paperwork because they're giving up their dower rights. That absolutely has to happen. My husband's not on my mortgage at this point in time, but anytime I go to sell the house, he's going to have to sign documents because he's going to give up his dower rights. Tenancy by the entirety. Again, creation of the four units of joint tenancy plus the marriage have to happen. The conveyance rights, the survivorship right cannot be destroyed. It's always there as long as the couple is married until they go through a divorce. The creditor's rights, underlying debt must be joint to attach. So again, if my husband and I sign off on a credit application together, we're assuming the bills together, our joint tenancy by the entirety, they can come back to our house. But if just me has signed off on this, they can't come and take away his rights. They can't go after his portion of the household for creditor rights. So that's always something through a bankruptcy or when there's creditor issues, they're going to examine who applied for the credit, how's the credit held, how's it being paid. Those are all things that they want to look at before they can attach to the property. Community property, assets and liabilities acquired during marriage by the labor of either spouse are to presume, presume to be together. So when actors and famous uh, ball players and stuff get married, let's say they became the famous ball player when they were married. That ball player contract is part of their community contract. But if he was if they were the ball player before they were married and then got married, what he brought into the marriage, that ball player, that contract and everything, part of it can be separate property because he brought it into the marriage. Separate property remains the property of the single spouse responsible for bringing in the marriage or for inheriting or that was tied to it. Conveyance of the interest, both spouse still have to consent to the transfer of the property. And the creditor rights, typically the creditor, one spouse can attach to community property. So that's where in Ohio, because it's not community property, creditors can't automatically attach to everything. Where other states, creditors can't attach to everything if it's held in a community property state. So again, what's in Ohio is not community property. Pre and post nuptial spouse, pre and post nuptial agreements can stop all of the community property, stop the joint property, a prenuptial before marriage, postnuptial after marriage, any of those agreements are more contracts that come into the marriage. 
Um, typically, when we get married, we don't think about a prenup or a postnup. We're getting married to that person, taking them for sickness and health and all the wealth and everything they're going to get. But when there is wealth involved, sometimes families pressure people to sign the prenups or the postnups because they want to make sure it stays, it's going to stay in the family, it'll never go to the spouse. Another way it'll stay in the family is if there's children. Again, not the spouse, but to go lineage down to the children. That would be a reason for a postnup or a prenup. Um, the Uniform Premarital Agreement Act is designed to create uniform governing laws regarding the premarital agreement. So this act is recognized across the country. So no matter what kind of state you're in, if there's prenups and postnups, they're going to govern as to how the, the, the estate is divided. Common law marriage is the status given to unmarried man and woman who hold themselves out to the public as married and act as if they are married. My husband and I lived together for five and a half years before we got married. At the time, when I managed the Enquirer building, I worked for a New York company. I wanted to put him on my insurance. This was in the early 80s. They said, well, if Ohio recognized common law marriage, then we'll do this. It was a New York company. And Ohio did recognize common law marriage in the early 80s. They quit doing it in 91 or 92. So he was entitled to be covered under my benefits. He bought a house in 1983. It was his VA loan that bought the house. We still weren't married. So I didn't have dower rights until we got married in the late 80s. Then when we got married, that's when the dower rights kicked in. It was up until that point in time, it was just his house. Over years, we financed, refinanced, been in and out of jobs. Now the house is just in my name. Same house, but things happen over time. You do things. Um, Dower and curtsy is the right of a wife to take the life estate in one third of the deceased husband's real property held by the husband. Curtsy is the husband's right to get one third of the wife. This goes back to feudal times. Um, when a spouse died, it was always presumed the spouse would get a third, just they could stay in the house and have rights to a third of the estate for the rest of their lives, and then everything would pass to children. Typically, it was thought that they would have more than one kid, but the idea was, was women didn't have rights in feudal times, but they had the ability to be taken care of. So this dower right, is it, it's a right to, for them to be taken care of, to have a place to live. Not necessarily other rights, but a place to live. And then when they die, it would stay within the family and would go on to children. So that's the whole concept of what the dower rights is. Rights and duties of co-tenants. They have right to possession. They can get rents from the co-tenants in possession. They can get rents from a third party, and they can share the natural resources. So if you're living on a property that has mineral rights, timber rights, things like that, farming, natural resources, everybody, co-tenants are entitled to the income from that. The duties of the co-tenant include protecting the co-owned property. So they got to be good sharing neighbors. The mortgage costs and taxes, necessary repairs and improvements and ordinary repairs. There's a case study in the book where it talks about so and so, uh, one of our books, where they go and they make repairs on behalf of the co-tenancy. They're charging a lot to the estate, but they have to make repairs. But they haven't checked with the co-tenant to see if it's okay. But they take it on themselves to make these repairs because they think their repairs are necessary from floods and stuff like that. There's debt as a result of this. They go to sell the house. There's still debt that has to be paid. The co-tenant that made all the repairs is saying that debt is 50% of my co-tenants because I made these repairs to the house. The co-tenant is saying, ah, oh, wait a minute. I didn't authorize those repairs. I didn't live here. I don't know anything about it, but I'm a co-tenant. Therefore, you took it on yourself to make these repairs and do the improvements. They come out of your 50% of the house, not out of the entire house. What happened was is the law ruled in the favor of the person that didn't have knowledge. So everything goes to the person who had knowledge of it. So co-tenancies, again, you're sharing. You need to communicate. You can't operate in a silo with co-tenancy. If you don't tell the other person what's going on, they can assume that you're doing everything with your half interest, and you're going to pay for it out of your half interest.
Um, so that's where the mortgage costs, repairs, things like that comes in. Partition. If you're not happy with how things are going, co-tenants can ask the court to partition, divide or sell the property. And this will happen when tenants don't get along. When co-tenants are not getting along for one reason or another, they're going to go to the court. They may not agree to actually sell the house, but they'll go to the court and ask the court to help them through the sales process. They're saying the only way we can resolve our differences is to liquidate the asset. You co-tenant don't deserve it any more than I co-tenant deserve it. We're going to force the sale. We're going to go to the court and ask for the support of the court to force the sale so that the, the estate gets split 50-50 or however the tenancy is owned. So if the property can be equally divided, the court may do so. If a division of the property is not possible or is not in the party's best interest, the court will order the sale of the property. Again, this is when people are not getting along. They're asking for the court to help them do a partition of property. It's still one house, one piece of land, but they're asking this, the court to say, wait a minute, we're going to force the sale. So we partition your interests. We're dividing your interests. We're going to give you money. We're going to get you out of this transaction, and we're going to sell it and move on. Holding property and entity. This is where we come into the business, how you own property as a business. Most people, when they have investment property, are going to own it as a business outside of their personal residence. The reason they want to hold it outside their personal residence for investment property is if something goes wrong with that investment property, they want to protect their family property. They want to protect their family interests. Be careful, I have a good trap. Thank you. They want to protect their family interests. So they will hold it as a business separate from the personal interest. A lot of different ways as a business you can hold it. What we recommend to investors is that they form limited liability, LLCs. It costs $1,200 to a couple thousand dollars to get an attorney to help you to file the paperwork to go through the state. You can do it for less. But you can, you can do it on your own now, I guess, too. It's like $200 online. Yeah. But very often people file, use attorneys because they don't understand what the process is. If you can figure it out, more power to you. But we recommend you own the business. The, investment real estate and limited liability so that it is separate from your house, separate from your other investments, so that if something happens to that investment, it's just the limited liability, it's just that investment that, that anybody's going to come after. Once that investment is liquidated, you're free, you're protected, nobody's going to come after your own property. They're only going to go after that. So we've got general partnerships, we have limited partnerships, limited liability companies, corporations, and real estate investment trusts. Real estate investment trusts are basically stock hold, held companies. Anybody in this room can participate and invest in a REIT. You can buy stock in a REIT. The company I work for is a property management company, but the company I manage property for is a REIT. It's a large REIT that owns many shopping centers, and they have the power to buy these $35, $50 million properties because they have REIT, but they're raising their money through stock investments, through sale of stock. So there's a chart in your book. It talks about holding property in an entity where you have general partnership limited corp, S corp, limited liability company, and then how is it created? What's the ownership? How is it running? What's the liability involved of the partners? And what are the taxes? Corporations, we say they're double taxed. Corporations pay tax on their earnings. Then when people get their stock dividends, they have to pay tax on their stock dividends as well. So that's called double taxation. Limited liability, there's just taxes passed directly through to the partners. General partnership, taxes passed directly through. So there's just a one-time payment. Whereas a corp, there's typically a double tax. So a lot of people don't like a corp unless they do an S corp. An S corp lets you be resolved from some of your taxes. You, it takes a lot to go through a corporation, file articles of incorporation, execute bylaws, have regular meetings, take minutes, do all the official things you need to do to have a corporation. You have shareholders in a corporation. Um, the shareholders of a corp or S corp can be individually or they can be business entities. Um, in limited liability, the members who may be individual or other business entities as far as the ownership goes. 
but it'll go down and it'll tell you again how the how it's organized, how it's owned. What we recommend again for small real estate investors is to do an LLC. Now, the, the people I work for, it's a large REIT company, but every single property that I manage is a small LLC. Each one has a different name. And the reason they do that is if one of them has problems, we like to say they cut off their finger, let it go, and move on. Done this for a long time. Years ago, there's a company called um, General Growth. They own Kenwood Mall. A few years ago, General Growth, Growth, again, they had separate limited liability companies for all the retail centers that they own. A few years ago, they filed a bankruptcy, but they brought everybody all together to file the bankruptcy on the corporation. It did impact Kenwood because General Growth manages Kenwood, but they don't really own it. They manage for other owners. Um, but when they brought it all together, they changed the whole way the bankruptcy and limited liabilities are looked at by government by the judiciary system and how can you protect and just lose one and not lose it all. They decided to bring it all together to try to bring all the bankruptcy together and not just have to file for a several hundred corporations. They wanted to bring it all together. They thought it would save costs and time. And it was a mess. Um, but again, it changed the rules a little bit. So things that we look at today, how companies are going through a bankruptcy. Anytime we hear the bankruptcy issue, it's always like, okay, who owns them and how? What's going to happen with them? Okay, so the latest thing we're hearing, Mattress Firm is going to file bankruptcy. Mattress Firm is going to close several hundred locations. Mattress Firm is a tenant in two of my centers. So we're waiting to see, okay, what are they going to do? Do they walk away from the leases or do they try to renegotiate? In the centers we have in Kentucky, they're going to, they already reached out and said they want to renegotiate their lease. They want to stay, but they want to lower the rent. Or we can, as a landlord, say, no deal, you're gone. But if we say no deal and you're gone, we also stand in line with other creditors and get nothing. So if we had somebody ready to rent their space, we'd be telling them goodbye. <laughs> but we don't have somebody ready to rent their space. So we'll work with them on a reduced rent to let them stay. One of the things about Mattress Firm is they were also paying extremely high rent. They're the highest tenant rent in all my system. And we kind of question, what were they doing? And there's questions about who are they, what are they doing? We never see people in the stores. What are they selling to make all their money? Well, with mattress companies, it, you know, every square foot, they sell hundreds of dollars worth of merchandise for every single square foot when you go back and look at it. So they don't have to have that many sales to be paying for the employee that sits there in the rent. Just have to have a few sales. So, um, again... How they hold property and entity, what's going to happen. Everything you all deal in with as realtors, for the most part, is always going to be individuals buying a house. Or it's going to be the tenants in common, tenants in the entireties. Those are the two ways you're going to probably deal with most of the stuff you're doing. Real estate investment trusts, corporate entity trusts that invest in real estate. The REITs receive a tax treatment designed to reduce or eliminate corporate tax on income and capital gains that are distributed to shareholders. There's a lot of rules about how they've got to distribute 90% of their income to their shareholders. They have to have a minimum number of shareholders to be an active REIT company. Um, but REITs outperform most of the Dow, in the, the primary stock company hold indexes. So they're still good investments. But I belonged to a stock club years ago. They wanted to buy REITs. And we all said, yeah, they're great investments, but they never give you all your tax information until June. So if you're filing taxes for your corporation individually, you always have to get extensions if you own REIT companies. You end up having to amend your taxes because you don't get your information to file your tax and pay your taxes on the, the, the basically the stock earnings until June. So they frequently REITs invest in shopping centers, office buildings, and parks because we're talking high dollar things, you know, big dollar investments because they can raise a lot of money, and they do. Real estate securities issues, an investment in common enterprise with a reasonable expectation of profits in which the investor is not managing the business becomes a real estate security. So there's security issues, there's disclosures, there's things that have to happen. 
if you're going to presentation and they're trying to sell you on a timeshare, but they're trying to say, oh, this isn't just a timeshare, but this is a way for you to make money. Oh, wait a minute. Stop. Is it a timeshare for me to use or is it a way for me to make money? What are we really looking at here? If it's really a way for me to make money and I get to use it a little bit, am I really looking at a security? What's the real issue here? There's a lot of laws when they're, they're talking about timeshares and things like that. What's happening with the money? How's it being sold? It has to be registered at the state and federal level when they're doing real estate securities. Real estate that's sold cross-border, cross-state. When a, a New York firm owns a bunch of land in Ohio and they're trying to sell the land and stuff like that, they also have to file a lot of paperwork. It's a real estate security once they start because you're out of state holdings. So we talk about real estate securities. Again, you don't going to deal with this a lot in your real estate license test. You just need to know that those kind of activities are out there. It's more sophisticated than what the typical home sale transaction is. And that's it for this unit. Any questions?